All right, while we are waiting for this to warm up, let's talk about what we discussed yesterday. Yesterday is really just a um, intro part to converting pressure units, okay? So again, those uh, six pressure units, you, you want to start kind of just whenever you have a few moments, just review them in your head, okay, or while you're looking at that slide with the equivalent pressure units, um, just so it starts to build up in your noggins, okay? Now, <clears throat> throughout this chapter, um, you're going to be hearing me refer to the term standard pressure, okay? And what that means is basically when we discuss standard pressure, we're trying to refer to atmospheric pressure when conditions are absolutely normal, okay? And so when we say standard pressure, that is going to be equivalent to one atmosphere or 760 torr or also 760 milli, uh, meters per mercury, of mercury. 101.325 kilopascals, um, 1.01325 times 10 to the fifth pascals, 1.01325 bar, okay? So any of those numbers that we saw on the pressure equivalent slide are all considered standard pressure units, okay? And before we get into the section, it is an appropriate time of year that we talk about weather and its relation to pressure. So, if you watch the weather as much as I do, but I'm a little bummed now since we don't have like an actual cable or satellite service, we don't get the weather channel, which is stupid because weather is a big and popular thing for people to discuss and watch. Um, as you get older, when you have to meet people that you don't really know, you're like, well, that's pretty nice, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, so, knowing a little bit about the weather, when you get into those awkward uh, communicating situations, I'm like, you sound like a genius. Anyway, when you hear the terms low pressure, high pressure, what they're talking about is really the atmospheric conditions and how the atmosphere is behaving. So, when we have low pressure, we actually have the air warming. What do we know about when things warm up? They expand. Gases are no different. When gases warm up, they expand, they start to move around more, and the distances between them increase. So when you have the distances of the molecules increasing, you have less of that air in that column that we discussed yesterday bearing down on you. And so you have less mass, really, per unit area bearing down on you, so the pressure's lower. And same thing when we have high winds, okay? High winds typically uh, are going to be considered low pressure. So when air, uh, air warms up, it tends to rise, okay? When it does that, it goes into higher altitudes in the atmosphere, and then once you get higher up there, it gets colder. Those gases, as they rise up, cool down, condense, and form clouds, okay? When we have this, we tend to get rain, thunder, and it causes a pressure gradient. So as you've seen the last couple of weeks, we've had really crazy winds. So and we, they've been kind of related to as it's been warming up. Well, the atmosphere at this time of year is all kind of crazy, okay? We're still not at the consistently warm part of the year. And so we still have some cool times, some cool fronts and cool jet streams going on. So as we warm up, well, the areas that are cold, they don't like that. They gotta find a balance. There's that theme again, balance. And so it'll rush in and create these winds. And when it does that, it's also gonna ramp up the warm air even more. Because cooler air is heavier, so it's gonna ramp up that warm air even more, which again leads to thunderstorms. And when you have a drastic change in temperatures, oftentimes that's what leads to more severe storms. On the flip side, we have high pressure, the air is starting to cool. And so it sinks, so it's become warmer. And that's when we usually have nice winds. So we have these high pressure systems coming in here. 
Um, when it's enough of a high pressure, um, that's when we start seeing, you know, events like snow, frost, stuff like that, because all that cool air has just been dropping down. And so that's when we feel the effects of that. All right. Now that you know about weather, you can talk to um, random people about it. And they're like, excuse me, ma'am or sir, I really don't know who you are. Please stop talking to me about the weather. But you'll at least be able to give some information. Section three is discussing gas laws. Okay. And so we've got a few gas laws that we need to know. And with each gas law, there's going to be um, sections that you should highlight or underline. Okay. Because as we look at these gas laws, there's going to be some consistencies with them. Pressure, volume, and temperature. Okay. And so <clears throat> those are the three things that we are going to investigate along with moles. Okay. How do you know, remember what moles are, Avogadro? Okay. How does the amount of moles play a factor into gas uh, characteristics? So let's first start with Boyle's Law. Okay. Boyle's law states that the volume of a fixed quantity of gas at constant temperature is inversely proportional to the pressure. So what I want you to highlight here in Boyle's law or underline is constant temperature. Because of all the laws we're going to see, something's going to be held constant. Okay? When you heat water to 100 degrees Celsius, what does it do? It boils. Boyle's law relates to constant temperature. <coughs> That's one little way to hopefully help you remember that this law, we have constant temperature and we have volume and pressure changing. The equation for Boyle's law is right here. So if you want to, it's a little small here. So if you want to call its attention uh, to you, circle it, underline it. Highlight it, whatever you need to do. <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me. When we look at this, we see that we are only concerned about pressure and volume for oil. We look at these two images here. On the left, we have a gas volume of 60 milliliters in this space right here, in the closed off end. As we add more pressure to this tube, look what happens. The gas volume condenses. So as we increase pressure, volume reduces. There's that um, inversely proportional relationship. As pressure increases, volume decreases, and vice versa. As pressure decreases, volume is going to increase. And you don't really need to worry about this if we were to plot these. This is just verifying the notion that pressure and volume are inversely related. Okay. <clears throat> Next is Charles's law. Charles's law states that the volume of a fixed amount of gas at constant pressure is directly proportional to its absolute temperature. So Charles's law holds pressure constant. Okay, that's another thing you need to underline or highlight. Um, so again, with Charles's law, this one we're only looking at ah, gum. Gum is making me <coughs> not talk right. So, Charles' Law, only looking at volume and temperature. So imagine we have a balloon that's filled up to a certain volume. What Charles' Law is going to state that as we warm up, now I don't recommend heating a balloon with a candle. Okay, just for future uh, reference, bad idea. You're not going to get very far at that. So, what they're saying, though, is as we heat this balloon, we are heating the gas in here. As temperature increases, 
the volume increases because we have that expansion of the molecules. When you give energy in this, uh, in this uh, scenario you, uh, is heat, you give heat energy to those molecules, they begin to go crazy. It's like giving a kid a Red Bull, okay? Or, I guess, bang energy drink. I don't know. That, that was popular last year, right? It's still popular? Okay. And hopefully, since I dropped a few names on there, I get some kickbacks from those companies. So, you know, I got a million viewers on these YouTube videos. Um, so, they are increasing because they, a distance because they have increased energy, and they are causing them to hit the walls of that balloon more vigorously and more often. So that's going to cause this to expand. However, if we were to take that same balloon initially and then cool it down, cooling it down removes energy from the molecules in the balloon. And when you cool molecules of air, they condense. Their distance between them decreases. They have less energy. And therefore, they're not going to be hitting the walls of that balloon as uh, frequently or with less or, or even with less energy. So Charles law, constant pressure. Again, this example is great in terms of pressure because you put a certain amount of air in that balloon and tie it off. You cannot have air go in or out. So everything's being held constant in there. <clears throat> Next is Avogadro's law. Okay, now Avogadro's law, the volume of the gas at constant temperature and pressure. So when we were talking about Avogadro's law, again, constant temperature and pressure. The two things are being held constant. <clears throat> that volume is going to be directly proportional to the number of moles of the gas. And so what that means is if we are holding... Uh, temperature and pressure constant, then if we add or remove amounts of gas, that's going to change the volume. Okay? So let's take these three laws and apply them to scenarios. Okay? So underneath the sample exercise 10.3, we've got three scenarios that we need to look at and determine whether or not something's going to change, okay? In these cases, we need to indicate how each of these scenarios is going to affect the average distance between molecules, the pressure of the gas, and the number of moles in a <laughs> gas cylinder, okay? So let's, let's start. Our first scenario is we are going to heat the gas from 298 Kelvin to 360 Kelvin at constant pressure, okay? So what do you think is going to happen to the average distance between the molecules as we heat it? What, what are they going to do? Is it going to increase or decrease? What was that? Increase, yes. It's going to increase. What about the pressure of the gas? What about the pressure of the gas if we heat it up? Do you think it's going to increase or decrease or no change? Think about Charles's law. What do you think? Oh. <clears throat> so, meeting the gas while maintaining constant pressure will cause, well, okay. I forgot to include this in here, my bad. Um, suppose that we have a gas confined to a cylinder with a movable piston, okay? So we have a little, a little scenario to where we've got a cylinder, oops, and in this cylinder, we have a movable piston right here. Okay, and we have to decide what happens to that piston. Okay, so heating the gas while maintaining constant pressure will cause the piston to move and the volume to increase, okay? So the distance between the molecules will increase, like we said. 
And at constant pressure, obviously, the pressure will not change. And neither will the number of moles because we are not adding or removing the number of moles. We are simply heating it up. Okay? Scenario two, we're going to reduce the volume from one liter to 0 0.5 liters at constant temperature. So we are going to compress this gas. So compressing the gas into a smaller volume does not change the total number of gas molecules because, again, it did not say we're adding or removing moles. So the total number of moles remains the same. However, the average distance between the molecules, because we are compressing it, it must decrease. So therefore, the reduction in volume causes the pressure to increase. That's Boyle's law. And lastly, we're going to inject additional gas, keeping temperature and volume constant. What law is that? Temperature and, what was it? Uh, no. Temperature and volume, constant. We're also dealing with the addition of moles. Be Avogadro's law. Okay. <clears throat> so again, we're keeping uh, temperature and volume constant. We're injecting additional gas. So injecting uh, more gas into the cylinder while keeping the volume and temperature constant is going to result in more molecules and therefore an increase in the number of moles of gas in the cylinder. The average distance between the mole or molecules must decrease because you're adding more to a confined space. It'd be just like adding more students in here. Okay? If we if you are all moles of gas in here and we keep the volume constant by keeping the doors shut, we then inject more students in here, the distance between all the students is going to reduce. And so if we inject a whole room full of people that you might not like so much, your pressure is going to increase. Okay, so keeping the volume constant and adding more into a uh, a volume is going to increase the pressure. So <clears throat> those are some applications of how we can not necessarily calculate. Um, the laws, but use them to justify our reasoning. Now let's look at a couple other ones here. Okay, practice exercise says recall that density is mass per unit volume. So D equals mass divided by volume. So thinking about density, what are the only two things that we need to really take into consideration? Mass and volume. So. What happens to the density of gases when the gas is heated in a constant volume container? First off, is the mass gonna change if we heat it up? No. Is the volume gonna change if we heat it up in a constant volume container? No. So there's not gonna be any change in this scenario to the mass or volume. So therefore our density will not change. Second one is the gas is compressed at constant temperature. So now we are reducing volume while keeping the same mass. Will that cause an increase, a decrease, or no change to the density? Again, think about the formula, mass divided by volume. We are reducing the denominator. What do you think? Of those three options, increase, decrease, no change, what do you think? It. It's going to increase. If your mass stays the same, which is your top number, and your volume reduces, which is the bottom number, you're going to see an increase in your calculation. So an increase in your density. And lastly, additional gas is added to a constant volume container. Okay, so... <clears throat> Our container is constant volume, so we can't change that. But we are adding more 
gas molecules to it. So that means that our mass is increasing in our sample size. So our mass top number increases, our volume bottom number stays the same. What's gonna happen to the density then? Increase, decrease, no change. It's going to increase as well, okay? Um, so again, using these gas laws, without even calculating them, which we're going to calculate them next week, uh, Tuesday first thing, um, again, we can just use real life scenarios to help us predict what's going to happen, okay? Now, what I want to do, we got plenty of time here, is I'm going to do a second example of a manometer, all right? And I've made this one up, so you want to make sure you write this down in your notes. Okay. So here's the specifics of this problem. First off, the atmospheric pressure is 763.2 torr. Okay. What we need to do, actually, before we get there, here's what I have in terms of my manometer setup. I've got my gas cylinder here and it is connected to a youtube okay again it's open and just like we saw in yesterday's if i can draw a straight line okay there's the bottom of the tube and what i have here is this scenario okay This is what is happening to my mercury. Now, again, the atmosphere is affecting the open end arm here. So just by looking at this, do you think the atmospheric pressure is greater or the pressure of the gas is greater? I'll give you a hint. Whatever side of the arm has the lowest mercury, has the greatest pressure. So which one has the greatest pressure? Atmospheric side, okay? <clears throat> so remember that the difference between the two heights is our H. And I can't remember if I shared this with you yesterday because I was trying to eye time, but H to calculate that is as long as it's in this setup with the gas on the left hand side it'll be the right side height minus the left side height okay so just a few bits of other information the right side height is 99.8 millimeters of mercury. The left side height is I can't see what my what I wrote is 140.1. So in case you can't see that it's 140.1. 140.1. And that's also in millimeters of mercury. I just ran out of space because I am a terrible drawer. Okay. So if we recall from yesterday, in order to calculate what the pressure of the gas is, that's what we're trying to figure out whenever we're using a manometer. Is when we use a manometer, we wanna determine the pressure of the gas, okay? So first we have to determine what the pressure of the gas in the flask is. And so we have P gas is equal to the atmospheric pressure plus H, okay? So when we put our numbers in here, again, our pressure of the atmosphere was 763.2. 
and that's torr. But you notice that I have here millimeters of mercury, and my atmospheric pressure was torr. Now, do I really have to do any converting between those two units? No, because they're it's a one to one. 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to 760 torr. So I can easily just swap out the units when we're going from millimeters of mercury to torr or vice versa. So then we add our H. And don't forget, our H is right minus left. So our right side was 99.8 minus our left of 140.8. One. Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to calculate what the pressure of the gas in the flask is. And report it in TOR. Seven hundred and twenty-two point nine torr. Very good. So that's the pressure of the gas in the flask. So as you can see, the pressure of the gas in the flask, I love saying that, is less than the atmospheric pressure, which is good because that, that means our early prediction of just looking at this means that we have a greater atmospheric pressure. That's why the side closest or that is attached or exposed to the atmosphere is lower than the side of um, the gas. Now, let me ask you this question. If the pressure of the gas in here was equal to that of the pressure of the atmosphere, how would the mercury look like in here? Imagine playing teeter-totter with someone who weighs the exact same as you. What's that teeter-totter going to look like? It's going to be straight. They're going to be even, right? So if this gas was the same as the atmospheric pressure, the two sides of the mercury would be equal. Just throwing that out there. All right. Now what I want you to do is I want to take, you can't see that, the pressure in tor and convert it to bar. So what's the first thing that I write down here? What's the first thing that we always write down for conversions? The given, and the given is what we calculated. So 722.9 tor. Now, I want bar in my final answer. So where does bar go in our conversion factor? Top, which means tor goes on bottom, which allows me to cancel that out. So what value of bar do I use in my conversion factor? goes back to that pressure equivalent slide. Drake, what value do we use? Perfect. And then what value of TOR do we use? 760. Okay. So now what I want you to do is take 722.9. Multiply it by 1.01325 bar. Take that result and divide it by 760. And report your answer in bar. If you calculated it correctly, you should have 0 0.964 bar. Is that what you got? Excellent. So hopefully seeing another example of a manometer kind of uh, adjusted. Now, I do want to mention this again. As I st started saying um, at the very beginning of this when I was drawing it, again, in this situation, to where the flask with the gas is on the left-hand side, 
and the arm exposed to the atmospheric pressure is on the right-hand side, H is right minus left. If this was reversed to where the pressure of the gas or the gas flask was on the right and the arm exposed to the atmospheric pressure was on the left, what do you think this would do? If this flip-flopped, what do you think this would do? It would also flip-flop, okay? So just keep that in mind because my pictures, if I were to draw them myself, they're going to look in this format. Your book, on the other hand, they like to be sneaky sometimes. They might flip it, but don't let that throw you off, okay? Questions on anything today? All right. Um, no homework this weekend. Just enjoy the